The reason God has never called a woman to be a pastor and never will. Greetings to you all. I hope that you're feeling blessed and highly favored on today. And oh boy, you, uh, we're in for a good one. We're in for a good one today. You know, when I crack that Bible open, it, it has a tendency to get very real now. Uh, now, starting things off as to how we uh, got here on today or how I was blessed with this message or what compelled me, rather, to go ahead and speak on this. Um, like usual, I was speaking with a young lady. <laughs> I was speaking with a young lady and... Um, I'm not going to tell you what I was thinking, you know, but, um, yeah, I was, it was, it was a, a whole lot of good thoughts, you know, when I got on the phone with her, she on her looking thick, she looking right, you know, and so, uh, you know, we began to speak a little bit, and um, as we began to speak, I also preface this message as well, just in case it may reach a wide audience, um, you know, I'm not a Christian, anything to that effect, I'm just one who has uh, while well, I consider myself to have a knowledge of the Word of God, and you know we've had a long, extensive history, and you know uh, the gifts of the Lord come without repentance, and so um, one day I will be operating in my calling. But as of right now, um, I guess it would be safe to consider me um, backslidden, you know, uh, if that's what you would want to refer to it as. But I definitely consider myself to have a relationship with the Lord, and uh, but you know that's a different discussion for a different day. Um, now, going back to things, as me and the young lady began to speak, um, the first thing I noticed was that she had that Monique spirit on her, you know, that she was used to presiding over men or, you know, just operating in a rambunctious manner to where the man is almost the caretaker, the, you know, the sidekick, so to speak. And uh, because as we began to speak... And, um, you know, I'm speaking on certain things. She wanted to match me on everything. Oh, oh okay, yeah, I got that too. Oh, oh yeah, I, I do this. I do that also. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't. You, you, she was just doing all type of, you know, little things like that. So, um, but again, the appearance was, was right. And if you know Justin, you know, I like, you know, um, full figure women, so to speak. And uh, she definitely had that going on. And so, um, you know, I, I didn't really want to. I really didn't want to cause no conflict initially, you know. And so um, as we began to carry on and speak some more, um, you know, she began to ask me what I, what it is that I do. And, you know, I began to tell her about a message that I was putting together. And if you haven't checked that out, that was the message of Samson. And, uh, you know, I began to tell her, like, you know, as part well, for one, you know, my father used to be a pastor. So I really didn't even get too far into the message at first. And then she, you know, she immediately cut it out, cut me off again, <laughs> lowered, and said, oh, oh, really? You know, uh, my mom's a pastor too. Now, to someone who has no knowledge of the word, she hadn't said anything wrong. But for me, um, when she said that, my ears perked up immediately. I, I said, I say, huh? I, I said, prophetess? Uh, evangelist? Apostle, maybe? Like, uh I began to name uh, numerous titles, and um, she said no. She said no. Um, she's a pastor. I said, my God. You know, immediately, she could tell that you know I, I disagree with that. She was like, well, how are you so confused about it? I, you know, and I told, well, you know, if that's the case, if, if it's a pa if the, a woman is the pastor of the church, then yeah, baby, I won't be attending you know that church. And she said, well, why not? And I said, well, you know, it's just not biblical. You know, you you won't find anywhere in the word where a woman was called by the Lord to preside over men, yet alone be the pastor of a church or a flock. And, you know, immediately with this being her mother, she she got into a continuity of attitude. Well, you should have seen her. She, uh, well, uh, well, well, what, you know, and she, obviously she didn't have the basis or the, you know, the scriptural references to, to back up her claims. You know, it was just how she felt. And, of course, I was speaking from a scriptural standpoint as to what I know. It, I was speaking fact. And so, um, again, I instantly changed the subject and, uh, you know, I started asking about, you know, what she do for a living, this, that, and the third. And uh, But we ended up, we got back on because she kept on trying to throw that back in there. Well, my church that you were clowning, you know, this, that, and the third. And I'm, baby, I, you, she started throwing all type of accusations on me. But ain't nobody clown show church or nothing like that. You know, it is what it is. I didn't tell your mama she need to sit down. I didn't tell her she shouldn't be wearing no pants. I didn't tell her that she uh, didn't have a right to preach the gospel or teach it. You know, I just said that you won't find anywhere in the scriptures that uh, where a woman is presiding over a flock or being a pastor to a congregation or being a leader 
of men. And, uh, you know, she, you know, so we kind of ironed it out. And as I began to tell her about the message that I had concerning Samson, you know, she was, she was, uh, she was surprised by that, you know, so she know at this point, okay, this, this brother know what he's talking about. And so after I gave, after I, you know, gave her that brief synopsis of everything that I was going to be teaching on, she, I mean, she said, okay, well, uh, hold on. My mama texted me. Let me call you back. And so she was thinking that her mother was going to, uh, give her some type of, uh, extravagant explanation or be able to give her some type of substance from the scripture that would be able to promote her claims or to be able to push their argument uh, and to tell me that I was wrong. However, of course, she couldn't do that. And so, um, you know, her mother just told her how she felt, you know, well, we don't listen to those types. Girl, hang up on him. We don't, uh, woo, woo, woo. So instantly, you know, it's so ironic that the very reason why women have not been called to be pastors began to manifest immediately right there. So she sent me a text and, you know, she she showing me the, that they all on FaceTime talking about it. And, you know, obviously it was just a bunch of women talking about how they felt about it. And then she said, well, no, it was a good. And, you know, I even t I t I text her back. I said, well, baby, that's you want to ask your mama that. one want to validate what's going on. I simply made a statement because it came up. You know, I'm not here to uh, cast any judgment or condemnation on your mother. You know, it is what it is. Blessing to that, uh, to that young woman. And she said, oh, well, no, I understand that and I say well you know me operating in the spirit of wisdom if I was around your mother I wouldn't even brought that up you know but again that's you wanting to ask her that now uh, upon doing that she said well no you have a right to feel uh, you know my, like my mama said well, you have a right to feel how you feel again baby this is not how I feel this is in the word but that's what led up to this conversation on the day and rightfully you know understandably so that uh, you know, that uh, relationship really ain't go nowhere at all <laughs> after that, you know, uh, based on uh, the spirit that she was coming with. I just kind of knew that uh, she would be better suited uh, pursuing happiness with another gentleman. Um, today, we'll be going into, uh, from a biblical standpoint, why the Lord has never called a woman to be a pastor and why he never will. Now, starting things off, uh, of course, um, now, I won't get too far into this because I, I actually have another message specifically dedicated to the first commandment and how it is still relevant today. And then there, I actually go into the creation story. I go into the first commandments given to Adam um, before Eve was even into play. But there's one thing, and well, you should definitely go check that out as well. But there is one key thing that I wish to focus on as far uh, as concerning that. And that was... Uh, Adam or man initially from the Lord himself who doesn't need our help concerning anything he came down and after creating us he gave us charge and uh, almost commanded us to preside over everything so um, I want you to get that into your mind get that take that into context the Lord delegated all of this authority to us so everything that you see around you he gave us authority over in his name, and whether that be the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the mammals on the land, the entire world was Adam's, you know, to preside over, to watch over, to even name the creatures. And so, um, you know, it's very beautiful. And again, a powerful message. Definitely go check that out. It's one of the first videos I shot when I came on YouTube. But the main thing that I want to take away from that is even though Adam had all of this, he had access to all of this. He was presiding over the whole world. The Lord looked at Adam and saw that it was not good for man to be alone. And so here we see, uh, well, her name at the time was Adam because, again, Adam had to name Eve because she was a gifting to him. But the Lord looked at Eve and said that it, or he looked at Adam, pardon me, and said that it is not good for man to be alone and gave him a help meet, one that could assist him in presiding over all of this. And so um, I've heard it put, and you know, the gentleman, he put it so very eloquent and fluent, and it's one that I'll, I'll constantly use probably for the rest of my life, but no matter how great a gift is, no matter if um, I'm gifted with a BMW, a Ferrari, a McLaren, whatever you wanna uh, gift me with, the gift can never be greater than the recipient. And here we see, the Lord actually 
giving charge over even Eve. And so it was up to Adam to even name her Eve because she was the mother of creation. And so um, just like the Lord gave charge everything else to Adam, it was Eve as well. And this is why it's so detrimental. And again, I don't want to get too far into that message. You should go check it out. But the responsibility of everything went on Adam when uh, Eve participated in, uh, in, as far as eating the fruit. She brought it back to him. All throughout this, you see Adam just fumbling the rock completely. You know, for one, he hasn't laced her up because uh, the Lord has spoken to Adam concerning everything. And so he should have had laced her up properly to where when the serpent came in, she should have instantly known what was going on and to, to shut this down immediately. And even after that, once she brought the fruit back to him, he began to eat it like, hey, I, I guess she not ate it now. There's nothing wrong with it. But that's neither here nor there. The main thing that I wanted to take away from that is that the gift can never be greater than the recipient. And from the beginning, man has been given charge to lead and to preside over everything. His power and his authority in being a man. So a lot of men just have forgotten that nowadays. And we'll get, we'll get to that in a second. But that's the first part of what I wanted to take away. Now, secondly... We do know that the Lord is the same today, yesterday, and forever. His ways do not change. And that's actually in Hebrews 13 and 8. It states Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what is this saying to me? So despite popular culture changing, despite the world itself changing, if what this scripture is saying is correct, the Lord ways, the Lord's ways, pardon me, are still the same. And one thing that I know about the Lord, he believes in order. He believes in structure. And so typically, uh, anytime that you're fastening or, you know, uh, you call yourself a Christian or a follower of the way, um, typically you are to conduct yourself or you to use this Bible here that few people often read as almost an instruction manual. He has everything here laid out for you as to how you should move. So anytime that you saw um, if you are from the church that you saw a pastor ordained, you saw an apostle ordained, a prophet in the church, anything to this effect, anytime you saw somebody ordained, typically they're going to come and they're going to read directly from the scripture as to what this entails. And that's actually what we're going to get into on today. Now, now that we have that established that the Lord's ways are the same yesterday, today, and forever, let's move on to the next portion. What is a pastor? Oh, and so we're going to go ahead and get into the actual definition of a pastor because one thing that I found is a lot of people, they're content with uh, disputing certain things because they don't know the definitions or what these titles were actually meant to be. So anytime you don't understand the significance or the definition of something, it's easy to just combat it and throw how you feel about it willy-nilly and just change around the definitions to suit how you feel. So we're going to take that away on today and we're going to see what the scripture says concerning a pastor. Now, typically the role can be broken down into three parts uh, from a scriptural standpoint. You have an elder, a bishop, and a teacher. Now, the elder we can find in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 13. And this refers to the oversight of the believers involving teaching, preaching, caring, and exercising authority where needed, and servers as an elder and a teacher. And so we also have Titus chapter 1 verse 7 where Paul tells Titus uh, to appoint elders in every city. Uh, they will teach and lead the congregation in spiritual development. Ironically, the first thing that he says in describing the role is uh, one that's found blameless and the husband <laughs> of one wife. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, one, verses 1 through 4, Peter addresses the elders and tells them to be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. Um, and this is basically, in essence, the definition of a pastor. He defines it as a faithful steward. Okay. Now, what have we learned here? And actually, let me go ahead and go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll go ahead and read that really quickly. Give me one second here. All right. And so for purposes of, you know, for context to what I'm saying, I'll go ahead and read the whole thing here. Now, 
Uh, this is a true saying. If a man desired the office of a bishop, he desireth, again, a man desireth the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, a, a, Apt to, apt to teach, not given to wine, nor striker, not greedy of filthy lucrate, which is money, but patient, not a brawler, and not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house. Again, all uh, character traits of the leader or the man which God is called to be in your life. Uh, having his children is his having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? My goodness. And we just, that's verse five. Now, not a novice or not a rookie, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them with, uh, which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be grave, uh, not, um, double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. And so he goes into the deacons, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanders, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands, again, of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that abuse the office of a deacon will purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, did you catch everything, all of the points that I wanted to say there? You'll, you'll see a lot of recurring themes. Now, this is a letter from Paul, and so, uh, of course, to Timothy. And um, he's stating here, basically the prerequisites of one wanting to be a pastor or a deacon or uh, for this uh, for purposes of this, an elder in the church. And so as we go down here and we see all of the traits, you'll continuously see that he is referring to a man. He can he plainly etches this out for us to see here. And of course, with this statement, we can also uh, transition into my next point, which is God is not the author of confusion. Uh, but of peace. Now, where is this found? Again, I'm hitting you with straight scripture here. So this is in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verse 33. And let me go ahead and get in 1 Corinthians really fast. Yeah, y'all like how I'm navigating that word, huh? <laughs> yes, indeed. Y'all like how I'm going let you know I, know I know a little something you did. So let's see here. Get right on over to 1 Corinthians. And yeah, we ain't got no, ain't no markers in there. You feel me? We ain't have all these out. I just, I, I remember it. And I ain't been in this word in a little second. So let's see. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. What does that say? For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Take notice of that. So if God is not the author of confusion, we, we have that. We also know that his ways are the same today, yesterday, and forever. We also have that. And we also see how the uh, title of a pastor uh, or is, is to be defined as. So we have all of this from a scriptural standpoint. Now stay with me here because in a second, after I crucify this one or abolish this one way of thinking, we're going to actually go into uh, the, the titles or the roles of women throughout the church because they serve a very vital role throughout the course of the church. It's just not to be that of a pastor or to be presiding over a flock. First uh, Peter chapter 5, 1 through 4. So let's see here. Let me get on over to Peter. Right there after Hebrews, or James, pardon me. First Peter, chapter 5, 1 through 4. All right. And now, uh, <clears throat> the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, um, not, uh, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being uh, in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, uh, ye younger submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, uh, all of you be subject one to another. And be clothed with humanity, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And so, of course, with that, again, we see 
uh, Peter, this time giving more instructions as to the ways of an elder or a pastor. He's given more insight as to uh, what a pastor should be doing or the role of a pastor, and that is one of leadership and presiding over a flock. So again, going back from start to finish, the Lord's ways have not changed. So from the start, he's already given man, uh, he's already charged man to preside over everything. We see this even throughout uh, going up to the ministry of Christ himself. He never throughout throughout his ministry had one woman as a disciple. Or the scriptures don't specify that rather. And so this lets me know that from start to finish, the Lord has a set ways that he that he's done things. And if we're going to structure our ways after Christ Jesus, then of course we're only obligated or we're only right in following the scriptures verbatim as to how we should be constructing this. And if you ever want to know how clear God is concerning certain things, you can look uh, back into the Old Testament when he was instructing the children of Israel as far as um, how they should be moving, the sacrifices that should be made, uh, the, the building of the temple. He's exact down to the very letter as to what you know he he wants as far as his instructions so definitely keep that in mind he leaves nothing up to chance the lord is very clear he doesn't leave any room for gray areas and so uh very few things are up for debate throughout the word of god now a lot of things are highly debated but certain things again is are just not debatable and so now we're going to take another look at the scripture here and <laughs> this is this is a good one. So let me actually get to Jeremiah really quickly. Jeremiah 17 and 9. All right. And so Jeremiah 17 and 9, the scripture here states, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Did you catch that? Let me read that one more time for you. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, why do I read this passage? Why do I read this scripture? Um, typically, the it's pretty much safe to say across the board that uh, every woman genetically is governed based on how she feels. She's governed uh, based on how her heart is to respond to something. And so, of course, if you're any creature or any body that's governed by their heart, it can be misguiding. You know, there's going to be times where you're going to be placed in positions to where you're going to um, have people against you or you're going to have certain words uh, that are said to you or certain people that disagree or, uh, you know, much like I deal with the young woman. And if you recall back, I said the spirit was even manifesting as to why, you know, she was basically showing herself as to why a woman could never be a pastor because anything that disagrees with their spirit instantly you're going to want to get into emotion. Now, a man definitely is not to operate in this role. Now, men are becoming more and more emotional, which is, um, to me, a, a byproduct of this society. But a man of the word of God or a man of the scriptures, he's not to be moving or conducting himself in this way. He's to be mentally responding, being governed by logic and reason oftentimes, uh, and what the scripture says concerning things. So not quick to jump on certain things and uh, typically for across the board of women this is going to be a huge issue so uh, that is what uh, across the board is going to automatically disqualify women from being in any type of leadership because the first time a man says something to you that you don't like man you might shut the church service down for the day <laughs> yeah hey, everybody going home get on get out of here you know what i mean i don't know who you talking to you know she completely uh misrepresent what the Lord has called her to do, being unembarrassed and made a mockery of the Lord and uh, prevented thousands upon thousands of people from getting saved based on, you know, foolishness that's coming out of her mouth based on how she felt that particular day. And there's no making, uh, you know, there's no making that right oftentimes, you know, uh, because oftentimes individuals, they give Christians such a hard time anyway. Oh my God, you're such a hypocrite, this, that, and the third. So, you know, uh, for someone to be in leadership, you're certainly called to a higher standard and you cannot be uh, governed by your emotions, your feelings, or in this case, your heart, like we see here in Jeremiah. And so definitely that's another key takeaway as well. Um, before we actually get into the roles of the women themselves, uh, even as far as women in the position of leadership, if you look at children and how they respond to the authority of a woman, it's laughable to say the least. Um, I, as a child, a young black male, I never ran across 
any woman that I was afraid of, fearful of, anything like that. You know, it, no matter if she come back there blank and screaming, I know I can manipulate. I can play on her feelings. I can play on her. I, I know I could do this, you know. And even if she came back there calling herself, trying to hit on me or, what, you know, beat on me, whatever the case may be, it was laughable. However, uh, much like, you know, all throughout, even in, you know, mammals across the board, when you look at uh, the lion, when that male figure used to come back there, someone who stood for authority, yeah, he didn't have to pull that belt out. He didn't have to get physical with me. He didn't have to start cussing me out, none of that. All he had to do is come back there with the baritone, with the deepness of the voice alone. I know that this man meant business. You know, let me uh, refrain from doing what I was doing. I, I know what's going on. I know what comes after this if I continue this type of behavior. You know, so instantly across the board, um, even the children are much more attentive to that of a man as opposed to a woman. So if this is the case with children, how could women ever be presiding over grown men? This is laughable. This isn't Joan of Arc. This isn't, you know, all this fake uh, fairy tale Amazon stuff. We're talking about real life here. And if a pastor is to be a, a, a overseer, uh, someone presiding over a flock, there's no way. Uh, like I said, that brings me back to that Monique spirit to where you see her husband. He just completely emasculated. He looked like a Rudy Poot. He said, I remember when she was cussing D.L. Hughley out up on stage, just disrespecting herself in totality. It was nothing funny about what she was saying. She was just up there cussing and blanking and doing all this, that, and the third. And her husband over there sitting down in the chair looking goofy while your wife up here talking bad about another man. He don't even know how stupid he looking. My God. But that's that Monique spirit for you right there. Anytime you have women in a position of leadership over you, you're going to be looking goofy. Now, I want to um, actually go to the good side of ministry and what women have been called to do according to the scriptures. And so the first thing that we'll see in the scriptures here as far as with women, we'll see missionaries, we'll see evangelists. Um, and what can, these are kind of interchangeable, but uh, cross cult the uh, missionary typically crosses culture, spreading the gospel and uh, humanitarian aid. Um, a prophetess or a spokesman or the mouthpiece of Christ has uh, plenty of biblical references. Now, all throughout the Bible, we see prophetesses. Um, Miriam, Deborah, um, Hulda, uh, Isaiah's wife, who they just refer to her as Isaiah's wife, and Anna. Uh, we, we see this clearly throughout the scriptures. You know, women operating in this particular role as a prophetess or a mouthpiece of the Lord. Now, secondly, uh, we'll see a woman operating in that of a first lady. Um, you know, this is typically across the board and the, the uh, first lady is to be held in very high esteem. Um, you know, and again, I've seen first ladies, uh, powerful first ladies be, a, be able to preach. I saw powerful evangelists and missionaries uh, bring forth the gospel, very anointing. I've seen prophetesses tear the house down, um, you know, uh, giving a, a word from the Lord, speaking in tongues and then coming back and interpreting actually what that word meant, tearing the house down. So they operate in power. I've just never seen a, a woman called to be a pastor, and based on the scriptures, I never will. And uh, lastly, uh, the apostle. Uh, a woman can be an apostle. Uh, not always. Now, the difference between an apostle and an evangelist and a missionary, uh, apostles are not always cross-cultural, but uh, they still bring the gospel where it needs to be heard. So you'll see apostles all throughout uh, communities. Uh, I've seen a lot of black women, strong, powerful black women who can who can preach that gospel and, you know, and they do their thing with it and it rivals that of men. You know, some are even more anointed than men to bring forth that gospel. And so, uh, again, all of this that I've said, now one time I've, uh, I consider myself to have bashed women. Uh, I'm not a misogynistic person that thinks that, oh, woman, you don't have a place in the church. You need to be sitting down, being quiet. But I do believe in order. I believe in structure and I believe in the ways of the most high, especially when it comes down to his church. And so many people, so many individuals um, have deviated from this, which is to why I feel the church is in on uh, on life support, so to speak. We, we have no masculine men who typically want to be associated with the church. And this just wasn't. Um, how it was when I was coming up. It, like the church is almost laughable now. Uh, it's full of just homosexuals, which. Come on, I'm not even going to get into that today. But, you know, homosexuals all throughout, you know, nobody's preaching the, the pure, unadulterated word of God because 
they're scared of offending people. You know, nobody's preaching uh, hellfire and brimstone. Nobody's telling people that they're going to hell. Nobody's preaching against sin. Nobody's telling people to live holy. It's based on however you feel, feel good messages, self-help messages. And to me, this is just a straight abomination. And I know that this has to stink in the nostrils of the Lord because when I go through the word, I see power. I see authority. I see uh, condemnation. I see the Lord coming through with the sword. You know, it's not this happy-go-lucky little, little person that everybody be speaking of or that they the portrait that they try to portray to people nowadays. And so um, even when this young lady, when we had this conversation, this message was uh, provoked in me, um, it vexed my spirit, you know, to hear such, you know, to hear such things. But I, I simply know that they were misguided uh, concerning that. And, uh, you know, of course, much like with anyone, uh, my, my thing is, why haven't any, where are the elders in the church? Who actually ordained this? Who is presiding over this ministry to where they just let this go and they didn't see anything wrong? With this, uh, typically when you see these type of things going on in church, it's, it's some crookedness going on, and uh, you know, and now uh, we won't place any any blame on whoever ordained uh, who is actually you know presiding over this situation and letting her know that this is okay. But you know, I just wanted to come here today for uh, people who actually have an understanding or wanting to. Uh, have an understanding of the Lord concerning certain things. I want you to be able to identify certain characteristics. Now, I brought this to you on today, but you have to study to show yourself approved. You have to get into the scriptures because that is what's going to bring condemnation to you. If you have no knowledge of these type of things that we're speaking on here, then much like when the young woman just slid that statement in there, oh, my mama's a pastor too. You wouldn't have thought anything of it because you don't have any knowledge of the word. You don't have any knowledge of the ways of the Lord and, and how, you know, from start to finish, you, you, that you will never see that in the scriptures. The only way that I was able to identify that is because of the knowledge that I have of the word of God. And so I would encourage you, if you take if you don't take anything else away from this, study to show yourself approved because all of the answers, every, you're going to hear a lot of things in today's times. You're going to hear a lot of people twisting the word of God to make it fit to whatever they desire as far as with having itching ears, you know, but the, not so with the Lord. If you want a clear cut understanding as to how the Lord is operating, it's right here for you. You know, it's right here for you. The blueprint, the manual, so to speak, uh, to salvation, to uh, living a holy life, to actually having understanding and to navigating through life accordingly um, is right here for you. So if anything else, uh, definitely I encourage you to go ahead and get into that word and to seek Yahshua for yourself. But, you know, as far as with that, uh, we'll go ahead and leave it there for now. Uh, if you do have, uh, you know, dispute or if you have art with what I'm saying here on today, uh, don't tell me what you feel. You know, please jump in the, the, the you know, you can jump in the comment section if you have scripture that uh, I might have overlooked to where you saw somewhere in the word of God, um, a woman presiding over a church or presiding over men, uh, if you care to dispute that, then definitely go ahead and let me know what's going on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, definitely feel free to comment, uh, like the content, subscribe to the content for more. Uh, let me know if you want me to uh, address other things that you might, uh, misconceptions or certain things that you've heard in the church or certain things that your pastor is saying, if you, uh, if it's not necessarily agreeing with your spirit and you may not know necessarily where to go in the word, uh, get at me. You know, I, I, I will definitely love to go over that with you. And, uh, you know, this, uh, it'll be, it'll make for great content, uh, to say the least. But again, blessings to everyone out here on today. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in and until the next time, take care.